When you think about the term business continuity, one of the things that comes to mind first is how to successfully get your data off-site to a remote location to protect against a large-scale outage, such as a natural disaster or a data center failure. One of the things that Veeam has built in with our product is backup and replication. Replication does much more than simply replicating backup data to another storage target. Our replication functionality will actually take a source workload and generate a fully hydrated, fully functioning copy at a remote location, standing by ready to go at a moment's notice should you find yourself in one of these large scale issues within the data center. Let's take a look on the light board at exactly how this works and what options you've got available. Now that we're at the light board, let's take a deeper look into exactly how Veeam does replication and how it differs from a typical backup copy job. The first thing you'll see here on the light board is we've got two geographies drawn out. We've got our production site with a basic VMware environment on this side. We also have a disaster recovery site with a similar basic diagram drawn out. In the middle, we also have some sort of connection between these sites, whether it's a WAN, MPLS network, or a VPN tunnel. Now the first thing to make sure we draw the difference between is using a backup copy job. We're simply taking a backup that we've already compressed, we've already deduplicated, and we're simply going to transfer it from site A to site B, but it will remain deduped and compressed in the form of a Veeam backup file type, not a VMDK, not a VHDX, not anything that a native hypervisor would recognize. And it's also simply going to live on repository storage. Now, in contrast, when you go into the software and you build a replication job, that's entirely different. In this case, what we're going to be doing is looking at a source virtual machine and creating a fully hydrated, fully functioning copy at the remote location that's registered in inventory, simply powered off when it's not in use. So the idea behind replication is to enable a failover and a failback scenario. So if you have a large site-wide issue, such as a data center failure, an ISP outage, or maybe a natural disaster that's inbound, you actually have the ability to fail over proactively to avoid any such catastrophes. Now, the way the process works is actually quite similar to the backup process. When you first kick off a job, a replication job, we're still going to send a VSS command to the actual virtual machine if you've enabled application aware image processing. Now, once that has completed, we're going to take a snapshot of the virtual machine, just like we would do with a backup. So once the snap has been completed, then we start processing the data. Now, here's the thing. The backup job and the replication job processes the same way. It actually will compress and deduplicate. And the reason it does this is because of this connection. So think about if we were to just process the data, but not compress it, not deduplicate it, we're now sending over that bulk data size over this connection to the DR site. Instead, the initial process is exactly the same. We do the snapshot after VSS quiescing is done. We compress and dedupe the source data. We send it over the wire in that compressed dedupe state. However, once you get over to this side, we decompress it and we rehydrate it and we write it as a native, fully hydrated virtual machine ready to go at a moment's notice, already registered in inventory. And that's one of the key differentiators because you may notice that we've got the storage arrays drawn here at the very bottom as part of a SAN network. So storage level replication does have some benefits over host level replication, which is what we're doing, essentially communicating with the host, doing snapshots of virtual machines, when you replicate at the storage layer, you bypass all this and you're simply replicating a LUN. Now, the benefit is, generally speaking, you can replicate quicker because you're doing storage native replication of a LUN from array to array. Some of the cons, though, is generally you have to have matching arrays or at least matching vendors before their technology will communicate with each other. The other thing is with our Storage Technology Alliance partners, Veeam does actually have the ability to orchestrate storage level replication. Case in point with NetApp is SnapMirror. We can actually orchestrate that from within our console. But what we're talking about specifically is our replication job. Now, on top of this, you do have the ability to use a WAN accelerator. 
So if you have a limited connection here, let's say that's a limited circuit where maybe it's 20 megabit connection and you don't even have all of that to do the replication, you can implement a WAN accelerator during transit. Now, let's say all this is complete, all this is done, everything's ready to go. If we move back over to the DR site, one of the other nice things about the replication job is we do have a retention. Now, here's the thing. This is not the traditional retention that you're accustomed to with a backup job. With a backup job, we're talking about points in time that are gonna be incrementals that can be recovered from in the event of needing to go back and grab a different version of said data. Remember, over on this side with replication, we're not storing the data in a Veeam format, right? We're gonna be storing it as a native virtual machine. So the only way that we can hold retention is with snapshots. Okay, so on the target side, in a VMware environment, you can actually set up to 28 snapshots. Hyper-V, you've got 47, right, at current versions as far as capacities go. Now, do you need to store 28 snapshots on a VM? Probably not, but it gives you a nice buffer if you want to create a few restore points with your replicas so that if something happens at production and you don't quite catch it in time and you still need to fail over, you can fail over to a previous point in that replication chain. Now, the other thing that we need to talk about is job schedules. You have the same replication frequency options that you do backup options, meaning that you can coordinate the job based on hourly, daily, you can do it monthly if you wanted to do it that far out, or you can set it much more granular and get into the minutes or even leave it on a continuous replicating job. Now, there's also a misconception with this. If you set the job on continuous, that does not mean continuous data protection. Remember everything that we talked about over here. We still have to send the VSS call. We still have to do a snap on the VM. We still have to process the data, which means compressing and deduplicating. We then have to send the data over and write it on the target side. Once all that is complete, then we finally delete the snapshot and the job is over. Now, if you set it on continuous, all that means in the software is as soon as that process is able to conclude, we simply start it over again. So does that mean five minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour? It absolutely depends on environmental variables with regards to how fast that process can conclude. Now, the last thing that I wanted to make sure that we're clear on is we talked about the maximum snapshot retention. So for those of you who are familiar with VMware, you know that 28 isn't the max, it's actually 32 at current versioning. The reason why we don't allow you to go all the way up to the max is we need to reserve a few snapshots for protective reasons when we actually do the failover and before we do the committing of the failover states. So the way that this works when you get ready to do a failover, before we turn on these VMs at the DR site, we'll take a protective snap, okay? And the reason why this is done is if anything were to go wrong, we can undo the failover, bring everything back over here to the production side and remove that protective snap on the DR side. That way all the data is discarded if it didn't need to be captured, right? Or if something went wrong during the failover, we have the ability to issue that undo command. Now, the other thing that we'll look at a little bit deeper in the console is replication and failover is an intermediate step, much like our instant VM recovery feature. It's not a one-stop click and you're done. You fail over, but then you need to finalize it. You need to decide as a business, what do you do now? So once you have failed over, you have the ability to do a permanent failover. Now, if you do a permanent failover, that assumes that production is gone. Generally speaking, the permanent failover is reserved for when the data center suffered a major issue and you're going to need to run at the DR site for an extended period of time. You know, let's say for an example, the production data center was flooded you know that you're gonna rebuild and repair it, but you're going to need to run production at the DR site for a while, as well as continue backing up those VMs so you don't put your data at risk. That's when you do a permanent failover and everything runs at the disaster recovery site. 
Now fast forward to when production is rebuilt, you'll need to do a reverse replication. So now take these production machines that are technically running at the DR site, replicate back to the real production site, and then you've got everything running back at the location that you intended for, okay? Now, the other option, other than undo, right? Because we've already talked about undo. You fail over, you can undo and go back to production. You can fail over, issue a permanent failover. Those are one, you know, one click and done. Permanent failover, you're running here permanently. Undo failover, you go back here permanently. The other thing that you'll need to plan for is the fail back, right? Now, the fail back assumes that you failed over, you're running from here for a short period, let's say a day to even hours, and now production is ready to take that data. So all the changes that have been tracked over here we now need to resync to the production side. Now, if the original VMs are still here, but they're outdated now because all the changes are tracked over here, the failback will sync those changes back over and update the source side virtual machine with only the Delta changes. Now, what happens if the VMs are gone, but the production side is still there? We'll fail back the entire VM as it exists at the DR site, rebuild it at the production location. Right? Worst case scenario, production is gone, you've rebuilt, but now you need to fail back. Let's say this was a short outage and you had to rebuild everything. It wasn't the flood example where we're talking weeks. This might have been a day or two. So rather than do the permanent failover, you can stay in the failover state, get everything running back over here, and then fail back to a new location. So in that design, Veeam will actually rebuild all the VMs over at this site. Another option you may have is actually do a seed where if that scenario happened, you can take backups of the VMs over here, physically transport them to this site. So you circumvent having to resync all that data over the connection. Once those physical backups are here, you can use those as a seed to rebuild the replica VMs. Then we do just a Delta sync failing back just the change data. Okay, now here's the thing. Once you issue the failback, and you get back to this location, you can still undo the failback. So, if anything happened while you were syncing the change data back and you found yourself needing to go back to the DR site to either try again or make some modifications over here, you can undo the failback. Now, the one thing that's critical to understand though is when we do a failback, there's no protective snapshot that's taken on this side. So if you do the failback, then you undo, we've already made changes to these VMs that can't be undone, right? So when you try to fail back again, you can find yourself in a loop where you're just overriding data. So be careful with the failback, all right? Remember, once you issue the failback, we can't undo the changes that were written to these VMs. Now, if you don't need to undo the failback, let's say everything went according to plan, you're now running at production, everything is smooth, you've checked everything, you've made sure services are starting and running properly. The final step is to commit the failback. Now, this is crucial because if you don't commit the failback, you're still running in one of those limbo states, right? There's still protective snaps over here. Veeam still thinks that you're running in an inter intermediate phase. So it's important that once you have failed back and you verified everything is running, make sure you commit the failback, which will remove all the protective snapshots that you have on your replicas and bring you back to an operational state at the production location. Let's take a look at some of these settings in the software so you know exactly what options you've got available for replication as well as failing over and failing back. Okay, now that we're in the software, let's explore just a few areas that I wanna highlight around the replication functionality. The first thing is if we look at an existing replication job, I wanna show you a few of the things that we were talking about at the light board with regards to what options you've got. So the first thing is when you look at the destination, one of the things you're gonna notice right away is we're no longer targeting a repository. Instead, we are in fact actually targeting another host or environment to build the copy of this virtual machine on, including a production data store. 
Now, if you look further down in job settings, you do have the ability to give the replica a suffix if necessary. That isn't a requirement, however. And here's the restore points to keep that we were talking about on the board. If you need to keep that little bit of extra buffer so that you have that ability to fail over to a previous point in time, you can enter this here. Now, notice above where it talks about repository for replica metadata. This is actually where it keeps the metadata for this particular repository job. This repository needs to be at the same site as the source data and it also can't live on a scale out backup repository. It has to be a traditional Veeam repository. When you look at data transfer, this goes into how we send data from the source location to the target location. One of the things you may notice right away is there's actually two proxies. If you look at the backup job, the backup job only has a single proxy selection. So the reason we use a source and a target proxy is so when we process the data at the source side using the source proxy, that's what handles the reading from the source data store, actually doing compression and deduplication and sending over whatever connection you have to the remote site. The target proxy is going to be responsible for receiving that inbound data transfer, rehydrating the data, decompressing it, and actually writing it out to a target data store and registering it in inventory. Now, if you are doing on-site replication, which a lot of customers will do, if you're looking for high availability and you just wanna replicate certain data from host one to host two, you can actually use the same proxy for both the source and the target to cut down on network hops. Generally speaking with replication, we're talking two different geographies. So you want to be sure that the source proxy is actually pulled from the source site and the target proxy is selected from the target site. If you do leave it on automatic selection, just one of the things to double check when you're looking at job statistics. Now, right below this, you can see the WAN accelerator option we talked about. If you leave it on direct, that's simply going to go from source proxy to target proxy. If you go through WAN accelerators, then we're gonna leverage a source side WAN accelerator and a target side to try to further locate duplicate blocks of data that exist already in the cache of the target side WAN accelerator. So if we can locate duplicate data blocks, there's no point of sending those over the wire. They're stripped from the packets on the source side and reinserted at the target side when you get to writing the target VM at the remote location. Now, guest processing, we briefly mentioned, if you need application aware processing, make sure you enable this in the job. And this is definitely recommended for any highly transactional workload you may be trying to replicate. And finally, like I mentioned earlier, you have all the same scheduling options that you would otherwise have for backup jobs, including very granular choices, such as in the hours, minutes, or continuous. Now, the one thing we didn't mention on the whiteboard that's absolutely worth noting here is on the very first tab, notice you have the ability for network remapping. So if the source location has a different IP scheme than the target location, you can actually change up the IP information when you replicate so that when the replicas come online, we'll actually inject the new IP data into the registry during boot up so they'll come on with different IP schemes. Now, you also have the ability to do network remapping and the difference is re-IP is actually changing the IP addresses, whether it's the IP of the machine, the mask, the gateway, the DNS, the WINS, but when you talk about network remapping, we're now looking at virtual networks. So if your VMware environment, let's say, is different from source to target, where you've got different network names, as you probably know, if you fail over and you try to boot up a VM at the remote site, but there isn't the same network name, the NIC will not connect to any network. So otherwise it would be inaccessible. So it's important that if you do have different network naming conventions and settings, you'll want to map the source NIC to a target network so that when you fail over and it comes online, it'll natively be accessible. Now, one of the things we did talk about is replica seeding. So if you check this box, notice how you get the seeding option. Now, if we skim through this job 
and get down to the seating options, this is what I was referring to earlier. So if you find yourself in a scenario where, let's say you've done a permanent failover, you have to run at the DR site for quite a while, and now it's time to bring everything back to production. What you can do is get a backup while you're at the DR site, save it on some sort of removable storage, physically ship it or drive it to the production site, back to the original location. And once it's registered in Veeam inventory, you can actually get the seed from that repository. And essentially what this will do is build the replica VM from that backup. And then when you get ready to fail back, you're only going to be failing back the Delta changes versus the entire virtual machine data set size. Save you a ton of time and a ton of bandwidth going over that connection. Now the other thing while we're on this screen to mention is replica mapping. Big difference between seeding and mapping. Seeding is building the VM from scratch. Mapping assumes that the VM is still there, but let's say you deleted the job and you had to rebuild the job. Since it's already there in inventory, this is simply reestablishing the link between what the source VM is and what the target replica VM is. That way, moving forward, the job will pick up with delta changes only being transmitted over the wire. So those are your settings when you build the job. Now, what happens when you get ready to fail over? So if we look at this, one of the things I wanted to show you, we're not gonna demonstrate all the options such as failing over and undoing and permanent failovers and failing back and committing the fail back, but I did wanna walk you through briefly how easy it is to fail over. The first thing you can do is a right click in failover now, if you've got a specific VM that you wanna fail over. The other option, if you notice right below, if we zoom in a bit, you can see that we have what's called a planned failover. Now this is very beneficial if you have the luxury to plan, because if it's a real disaster, you probably didn't get a heads up on the disaster. So in that case, you would just need to fail over now. But I use the example of a natural disaster. Let's say your data center is on the East Coast, you know a hurricane is inbound, but you have a DR site on the West Coast. This is a scenario where typically you're gonna get a few days heads up so that you can plan accordingly, do a failover. Now, if you do that planned failover, what Veeam will actually do is we'll initiate that replication job so that we run a typical replication update, all the Delta changes that have occurred since the last job run. Then we will shut down the source virtual machine at production. Once it's powered off, we'll run that replication job a second time. And that'll capture much smaller amount of change, but there were still changes happening while that first run was concluding. So this way you don't get any data loss. We replicate all the Delta changes, and then we will fail over to the target side. So this way you have no data loss, you're planning for the outage, you'll move the workload to the colo and resume operations as normal. Now the one other construct to talk about is the failover plan. The failover plan allows you to set a priority at which you want virtual machines to come online. So if you had something like domain services, DNS, DHCP, and all that needed to be powered up first before anything else would work right, then you would want to set that as a top priority. Moving down, then you can set the order at which the VMs will come online, even the ability to set boot delays in between. If you know, for an example, one of these virtual machines just takes a little bit longer to initialize fully, you may have to increase the boot delay. Now, the other thing you've got the ability to do is run pre and post failover scripts. Now, this can be very, very beneficial if you need to run something that a script can handle before you even start the failover. And lastly, if you want to run a script after the failover is completed, such as a DNS update or something to this extent, you can actually create a script to do that for you. Now, if we do a basic failover, we right click and do failover now. The first thing it's gonna ask us is which point. Now by default, it's gonna grab the latest possible point that you have, but just like with backups, you can choose any of those other restore points if necessary. And when you hit next, the last thing is to give it a reason and then you're done. Now the reason why I've got the vSphere client here on the left is I want you to watch what happens as the log window starts progressing and you see I've got that VM highlighted. 
that we're modifying. It's the ATL OSE East Replica 1, which is the one that's highlighted. So you can see some tasks happening in the event viewer here below, and you've also got the Veeam log, which shows you we're actually powering on the VM, the failover completed successfully, and you can actually see it's this VM here that powered on. It's the OSE. I had the ISE selected. So there's the OSE VM coming online. Now, once the VM is running, notice over in the Veeam console, if we zoom in, you'll see that we have an active replica. Now, you'll only see the active with a bold if you've got a replica in that intermediate step that we talked about on the light board. So it's important to remember that if you're going to do a failover, you need to finalize the failover. Generally speaking, if you look in Veeam, anywhere over here on the left, and you've got something bold with a number beside it in parentheses, that means whatever that object is, it's in an intermediate step. So you need to finalize it. Now, just like we talked about at the board, you've got all these options. And what you can see is we could do a permanent failover, which is like what we talked about earlier. We're, we'll make the DR site the new production facility, and that's where business operations will carry on. You can also undo the failover or fail back to production. Now, we're not going to fail back since this was a basic demo test. So what we're going to do is undo the failover. Now, notice the tooltip that pops up. It's talking about any of the changes that have occurred at the DR site will be lost because remember the protective snapshots we talked about, all that's gonna happen is that snapshot will be deleted and the replica will get reverted to the state that it was in before we issued this failover command. So that's the way replication works within Veeam. That's the way the failover options operate as far as what you can do, intermediate phases. Remember, you need to finalize the failover when you initiate it. Thanks so much for watching this video and enjoy the rest of your day.